Whether you believe Dragon's Dogma 2 is a masterpiece is completely up to you and your experience with the game. Personally, I think the game is great as it took what made its predecessor unique and improved upon that formula. The intent of this video is to create a balanced take on the game that highlights both the good, great, and bad because I've seen far too many videos with clickbait titles saying this is a necessary or vital game, which just feels disingenuous because there are a number of rough edges. I'm not going to discuss anything regarding microtransactions because that's been beaten to death and because everything that can be purchased in the online store can be earned in game. I'm not going to discuss optimization as well because I know it's bad but it really only affected me when I was in different towns or cities. With that being said, let's kick things off with the pawn system. Now I think the pawn system is really good, borderline great because of the flexibility it provides when party building. I like the fact that the AI is generally helpful as they learn strategies in their various travels through their experiences and they will apply it when exploring or in combat. My pawn, for example, is incredibly aggressive and even though they are a magic user, they will tackle enemies to assist you in landing a killing blow. I think that having a balanced party is the best way to tackle the dynamic open world in Dragon's Dogma 2. Otherwise, you're going to get dragged away by wild dogs and get killed. While I love watching the pawns adapt and learn as you progress through the game, it's not all great because they can be really annoying with the in-game banter and constant need to point things out. I cannot enter a town without hearing the same lines or watching a pawn incessantly jump up and down begging me to take a certain path that they learned. I understand that you can immediately dismiss this and go about your way, but the moment they find another path they've learned, they will immediately go back to it. The positivity is great, but let me turn it down a notch, please. Pawns can also get distracted pretty easily when fighting enemies, and this is a pain in the ass when you're trying to make an escape because their need to protect you always leads to them getting ambushed or incapacitated. This isn't a big problem when I'm in an open area, but when I'm heading up a mountain, I would love for them to follow and not get yeeted off the side. As a side note, I saw some complaints on social media about some pawns not having offensive capabilities. And I immediately dismissed this because you can review their status and abilities before you hire them. So technically, it's your fault if you weren't paying attention to their skills. But what isn't your fault is if the pawn is properly armored. Listen, I get it. You want your traveling companion to be attractive, but that won't help them when they get one shot when the difficulty increases. Dress your pawns for success, you animals. Moving on, let's talk about the vocations and how they're all viable. Before we start though, I am going to say that the best vocation in Dragon's Dogma 2 is the thief. There is no wind up with this class. You don't have to wait to cast a spell. It is all gas from the start. And if you like the dual blades from Monster Hunter, this is your class. Now. This is obviously going to be biased, but I have absolutely massacred every enemy with this class. That includes field bosses, dungeon bosses, and dragons. While I don't think the damage output is great if you're just engaging in melee, the Helm Splitter skill, or its advanced form, Skull Splitter, can do massive damage because you go Sonic the Hedgehog on their asses for multiple hits. Also, you can find the formless faint scroll relatively early at the nameless village and it allows you to auto dodge almost every attack and the cost of stamina is not high. Enjoy. With that tiny rant out of the way, the vocation system in its entirety is great. Every class is fun to play. They all have their uses and they take no time to master. You really do gain experience quickly in this game. You can share traits as you level up your vocations to really optimize your character. And I honestly believe that after playing through multiple vocations in the game, there just isn't a bad one here. You do, however, need to keep in mind that your party structure is key in getting the most out of your vocation. You want to be able to give magical vocations time to cast spells to maximize their damage output, 
Otherwise, you'll find yourself overwhelmed and getting dragged away and eaten by dogs. Advanced vocations have special requirements to be unlocked and these usually require quests. And some of these quests can be something as simple as finding a weapon to unlock that vocation or finding out a specific NPC in the world that will act as your Meister. The Mystic Spear Hand is my favorite advanced vocation because that quest was great and the vocation itself is a lot of fun because you combine magic and melee. You also look really badass. It's kind of like a Dragoon mixed with someone who just has the insect glaive for some reason. It's fantastic, I really like it. Regardless though, all vocations are fun, but listen, the thief will make this game a ton easier on you if you are struggling. I promise you, you just become so strong so quickly with that character and you will just wipe enemies. You also need to have a balance party, by the way, but the thief class, look it up, play it, love it, lots of fun. So for this next section, I'm gonna rattle off a number of rough edges that impacted my overall enjoyment in this game. I wanna do this before I jump into discussing the one thing that I believe makes Dragon Dogma 2 special and why I feel like so many people are holding it in high regard. First, the camera in combat can be pretty bad when fighting flying enemies and enemies that have specific weak spots that must be exploited. This really doesn't apply to ranged attackers, but when you're a melee class and you're trying to be aggressive so that a flying enemy doesn't grab and launch a teammate, it can be grating when it becomes a guessing game regarding whether or not the skill you're using can reach that enemy. This will require you to work the camera so that you can track those winged bastards who I have come to hate so much. I despise harpies in this game. They are so annoying just because they're so hard to hit at times. Now, when it comes to larger enemies, targeting a weak spot can be a problem even with the generous hitboxes. Certain enemies like the Doolahan have a specific weak spot that must be targeted if you're going to do any significant damage. Not hitting a weak spot is going to definitely elongate a fight and this can become pretty resource intensive. Constantly lining up the camera isn't fun in these encounters and it kind of sucks because I believe combat is vastly improved over the original. Next, I want to discuss how climbing enemies can be hit or miss. Sometimes you feel like a straight badass because you're able to scale a cyclops or a beast and then hit them in the head for critical damage. And this is an amazing feeling, especially when you're able to knock them off balance and on their ass. But other times it can feel like a chore. Fighting golems, for example, sucks. And because you have to climb to certain surfaces on the body to attack weak points, you may find yourself lined up incorrectly because you have to fight the camera while climbing. This also applies to some of the dragon fights in which weak spots are only accessible by climbing. I would not personally dislike this mechanic so much if it didn't feel as rough as it did. But it is hilarious when you're upside down latching onto an arm holding on to dear life. Another rough edge that annoyed me but is in reality really minor is how even though you're in a party in which gear is shared you have to manually go in and drag items to characters for them to equip or so that you can present them to complete specific quests. I don't know how much Capcom looked at the system and said, yeah, that's, that's fine. A number of quests in this game require the delivery of certain items. And even though that item might be in the party, if it's not on the Arisen, then it doesn't register. It's annoying because it can compound quickly and there are just a number of quests that require you to do that. The last thing I'm going to discuss in regard to rough edges is that quest giving and quest completion in this game, specifically in towns and cities, can feel forced and disruptive. It's also quite buggy. And by all that, I mean, you can be wandering around a town or city trying to get your bearings, or you're looking to complete a quest in an NPC will just randomly show up and start going off about how I am the only person that can help them. It's very old school in design. You've seen this before. It's in Skyrim, it's in Starfield, it's in a number of other open world RPGs, but it's incredibly annoying. There are so many armed NPCs in this game that I can't be the only one who can solve your issue. 
I've also encountered issues where the game will interrupt combat if the quest giving NPC is in your vicinity to complete the quest. I was fighting a cyclops that randomly wandered into the city and I had an opening in which I could climb and was planning to deliver critical hits to the head. It just so happens that that vital NPC was there in an ox cart. So what the game did was immediately shift to that NPC, completely dismiss the fight and remove the enemy, all so I can have an awkward discussion in the back of an ox cart. Once that discussion was over, I was teleported to my previous position. Getting interrupted constantly in this game is a weird design choice. And I understand that the game wants to feel dynamic and have that feeling apply to the towns and cities that make up the open world, but it can get frustrating with how disruptive it is. There were several times where I've wandered into an area for the camera to cut away from my character abruptly and go to two characters that were having a random conversation. And the end result of that conversation would be a new quest for me. It doesn't feel organic in the slightest, and the weird thing is it really only happened in the city and towns. If I wasn't inundated by random requests, I would frequent these areas more often, but they just became a chore as I progressed through the game. Now that we've gotten to the end, I want to discuss the one thing that I believe really makes Dragon's Dogma 2 great, and that is the dynamic open world. Very few games have open worlds that feel threatening but Dragon's Dogma 2 nails it. Whether you're exploring during the day or at night, you are practically at the whim of this world and you need to be committed to the various systems that make up the game or you will struggle. I have seen a number of people say that Dragon's Dogma 2 is not that difficult and I completely agree as long as you play within the provided systems. And I personally feel that with this game that the scripted sequences really pale in comparison to what happens out in the wild. There are main roads that you can follow, but in the reality of Dragon's Dogma 2, there is nowhere that is safe. Goblins and bandits will ambush you regardless of the time of day, and if you are unprepared, you will be overwhelmed. Enemies will fight amongst each other, and while normally you would feel like this is an opportunity for you to gain easy experience, you never know if a field boss is just lurking around the corner. Griffins are opportunistic creatures who will stalk you relentlessly and will attack you when you're distracted. I've had a griffin attack me while I was dealing with a lightning golem, and that was a massive pain in the ass, but it was incredibly rewarding when I was able to successfully kill them both. Exploring this open world is incredibly rewarding. If you feel like items or equipment are overpriced, it really only feels like that early on. Once you've taken your time in a region, and completed some dungeons or caves, you're gonna notice that your finances have skyrocketed. The game is built in a way that the player is appropriately rewarded for taking the risk to explore. And while the nighttime is scary and genuinely dark, there are a number of enemies that can only be encountered at this time and their downfall will be to your benefit. You will get good resources that you can utilize to enhance your equipment and also sell if you really need money. I believe Dragon's Dogma 2 has nailed the risk to reward ratio associated with its open world and this justifies the decisions that the developers made regarding restricting fast travel. Yes, you can fast travel if you choose by ox cart, but there is a high likelihood if you rest, you'll be attacked. And yes, you can use a fairy stone to fast travel to an area, but only if there is a port crystal. And you have to keep in mind that port crystals, which can be rewarded through some quests, are generally in low supply. You need to be strategic with your decision making in this game because the wrong move may hinder you in the end. And you also have to remind yourself that there are quests in this game that are timed and they're indicated in your quest log. And you just have to remind yourself that I have to constantly keep moving to ensure that I successfully complete these quests. The developers weren't lying to you when they had stated in interviews that they want players to explore. This is a rare example of a dynamic open world that is not only challenging, but rewarding. You might struggle early, sure, but 
If you utilize the provided systems properly and you ensure that you're prepared to explore the open world, you're going to have a great time because the rewards are there and some can exceed your expectations. It just depends on how far you want to push it. I want to make it clear that I believe Dragon's Dogma 2 deserves all the praise it's currently receiving, but it is far from a perfect game. I think the rough edges that it currently has become more pronounced as the game goes along, and I don't believe the game is as challenging as some may make it out to be, and I've mentioned this before in the video, as long as you operate within the various systems. They are there for a reason. It feels restricted at times with the systems that they put in place, but they're there to ensure that you don't take continuous advantage over certain things. You don't just kind of run through the game, right? They want you to actually fully experience the open world. I will say though, that the open world is special because the game nails that risk to reward ratio that so many titles fail in. There's far too many open world games that will tell you to explore. If you see it, you can go there. But when you go there, that reward is not worth it. It wasn't worth the hassle, it wasn't worth the resources. But in Dragon's Dogma 2, it usually is. And it's a lot of fun. But let me know what you think. How are you enjoying your time with Dragon's Dogma 2? And that's gonna do it for this video. If you happen to like the content, please consider like, sharing, and subscribing. I'm Ken from Pixelated Thoughts, and I'll talk to you next time.